Good morning. Um, as I'm the last speaker in this session, uh, I'll try to keep it very short. I think uh, the previous speakers have already uh, explained a lot of the issues uh, that surround the digital dividend. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how to use this, but I'll find out. Um, so just to summarize um, why this digital dividend is potentially so valuable, um, I think this, uh, th this spectrum that is going to come available uh, when analog, uh, analog transmission is switched off um, has very good propagation characteristics. Uh, it, it combines reach, um, which is very useful to bring signals in rural areas, for instance, uh, and capacity. Um, it's also a very large amount of spectrum. Um, typically, w when we talk about uh, spectrum being available in other bands, it's typically in lower amounts, um, and this digital dividend is really a, a substantial amount of spectrum. Um, also, I think uh, Mr. Conway underlined the, uh, the potential uses of this spectrum, which are very wide. Um, I think the, uh, the, the key uses that, uh, that we've been talking about this morning uh, and that will be talked about further, I think, in Greece over the next uh, the, the coming months are uh, digital terrestrial TV, uh, mobile TV, um, and uh, cellular and TDD uh, mobile broadband networks, such as WiMAX and LTE. Uh, as well as low power uses, uh, program making, special events, uh, and public safety. Um, so at national level, uh, I think the, the key questions that are to be asked, uh, I think, uh, uh, have already been mentioned. Uh, just to summarize them briefly, um, uh, there are some technical considerations, in particular with regards to interference obligations with neighboring countries uh, under what's currently uh, the GEO6 agreement. Uh, the protection of existing uses, uh, in particular DTT in countries where DTT has already been, uh, been started. Um, there's, already some, uh, some, there's also sorry, some consumer considerations. Um, if you're a consumer and you already have a, a rooftop television antenna, uh, there is a cost associated with changing this antenna. Uh, similarly, if you already have a set-top box for one type of digital terrestrial television, uh, there might be a cost if uh, you're forced to change this set-top box. Uh, and then interferences that uh, previous speakers have already mentioned uh, in quite a lot of detail. Uh, in terms of uh, commercial and economic considerations, um, uh, I think the, the four elements that we've got here are first the availability of, of alternative platforms. Um, clearly, some services can only be uh, carried in the digital dividend spectrum or in the, the, uh, the UHF spectrum, uh, in particular DTT, uh, but other services can also be carried uh, on other bands, for instance, the 2.6 gigahertz band, the 900 megahertz band, etc. Uh, the scope for economies of scale, uh, we'll talk about harmonization a bit further, uh, and economies of scale are clearly one of the benefits that can be achieved from more coordination or harmonization at the European level. Um, existing services, uh, there is a cost in redeploying them uh, if, uh, if the band is to be reorganized or coordinated. Um, there are questions about content rights, transmission rights. Um, clearly, we talked uh, earlier about networks and contents. Um, if, uh, if a content is being broadcast in one country under a certain set of rights, it might not be uh, broadcastable uh, in a neighboring country, so you need to be careful as to who can receive this, uh, this program. And then there are some regulatory and sociopolitical considerations. Um, there's uh, the definition of property, property rights to the spectrum. Um, I think uh, Mr. Economou mentioned one of the provisions of, uh, of the uh, law 3592, uh, which, as I understand it, um, um, enables the ERT to, uh, to essentially dispose of the spectrum that's freed um, after switchover. There are some license obligations, in particular with uh, regards to universal service, coverage obligations, etc. Uh, and, and then the very important aspects of social value, um, which include, in fact, uh, regional provision, local programming, etc. Um, so why is there a European dimension to this? These, uh, th these elements that I just mentioned are essentially national. Uh, each national regulator is looking at them from their particular perspective. Um, but what's very important to understand is that the economic benefits that each member state can get from this digital dividend spectrum uh, can be diminished uh, if coordination isn't, uh, isn't sufficient. Um, for instance, I think we've talked in quite a lot of detail about high power uses of spectrum, in particular DTT, and the need to coordinate at borders uh, in television broadcasting. Um, the nature of the spectrum, I mentioned the, the, the sort of good compromise between reach and capacity. 
um, which means that this is possibly the band where innovation in the future um, uh, is most likely. Uh, economies of scale are key for many potential uses. Um, for instance, mobile handset, DTT receivers, um, having a, a harmonized um, use of the spectrum will allow, to, uh, will allow more economies of scale to be, uh, to be achieved. Uh, I think Matthew Conway mentioned that uh, this could be worth two, or two to three billion euros uh, in the UK. Um, then again, there's the dimension of the single market uh, and the benefits that can be achieved from, um, from enabling uh, citizens of the EU uh, to use devices and services across borders. Uh, and then finally, it's a, a unique opportunity to, to coordinate things across border because uh, there is a timeline which is uh, reasonably well defined where all, this, uh, all these questions are being asked. So the reason why, I, why I'm here talking to you today is uh, because uh, my company, Analysis Mason, has been mandated by the Commission uh, to provide some inputs into uh, its, its roadmap, its recommendation. Um, and we'll be looking at a, a number of uh, streams of work, which I won't go into, into too much detail, but which involve first and foremost uh, an understanding of the national situations. Um, then socioeconomic analysis, uh, looking at uh, several scenarios. And finally, some, uh, so, some recommendations for roadmap uh, for coordination. So once again, without going into too much detail, uh, the sort of areas for coordination that, uh, that we'll be looking at uh, are the, the amount and the uh, location of the coordinating spectrum within the band, uh, the type of uses uh, that are to be allowed uh, or disallowed, uh, the approach taken to the award of digital dividend spectrum. I think we've, we've uh, talked about uh, both auctions and uh, beauty contests. Um, the timing of any primary awards, I think uh, previous speakers have emphasized the need for speed. Um, so this, this timing issue is, uh, is quite important. The scope for a secondary market activity, uh, spectrum trading, etc. And finally, uh, obligations, renewal rights uh, that are attached to, uh, to this spectrum. Um, so there are a number of options that are opened uh, for action at EU level. Uh, I think at this stage we're not um, ruling out any of these, uh, of these uh, path of actions, uh, and I don't think anything has been decided at all uh, as yet. Uh, but clearly the, uh, the Commission could decide to, uh, to take no action and to leave member states um, to pursue their, um, their sort of national interest. Uh, within, the, uh, within the purview of, uh, of GEO 6 and existing, existing agreements. Uh, the EU could provide guidance on uh, key policy areas, uh, such as the availability of spectrum, maybe a subband of spectrum, as we've talked about earlier. Uh, or maybe a mixed approach, uh, which may, might include some aspects uh, which will be mandated and some aspects which will be left to, um, to the discretion of member states. Um, I won't dwell on uh, technical, uh, technical evolutions. I think uh, the speakers before me have uh, explained very well uh, the uncertainties um, that, uh, that beset this debate with regards to, to uh, the future of HD transmission, um, new technologies, new compression technologies, etc. And finally, just to, to give a, a brief idea of the time, timing uh, of this study, uh, it, it's a very long study. It's a study that started, I think, in earnest in December. Uh, and is, uh, is forecast to last until September. Um, we're very much uh, at this stage in the, uh, in the information gathering stage. Um, I think we, 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 we've been discussing with member states, um, we've been uh, with a questionnaire which has been forwarded to the, to, to the different authorities uh, and we're getting responses uh, at the moment. There's a, a number of dates, a couple of dates which are important uh, coming up, which Mr. Niebold already mentioned. Uh, 6th of March, there's a stakeholders hearing uh, where different representatives from, uh, from the broadcasting, the mobile uh, industry, uh, and other interested stakeholders are invited to provide their views. Uh, and I think there's a tentative meeting on 1st of April um, with member states. Um, so I think we, 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 we're looking forward to getting the input from, uh, fr from Greece on this, uh, on this topic. Um, I understand from the discussions this morning that it's a, it's a very complex process which is, uh, which is creating a lot of debate. Uh, and I hope, uh, I hope we'll have the opportunity to, uh, to get your input and to discuss with you um, what's relevant for you. Thank you very much.